This is Apollo Control. At the present time here in Mission Control, we're involved in a change of shift. Uh, flight Director Glenn Lunny is coming on to replace uh, Milton Windler and uh, his team of flight controllers. And uh, Lunny at present is uh, consulting with the uh, uh, his team of flight controllers, getting status report, uh, getting up to date on uh, the status of spacecraft uh, and mission. At 92 hours, 14 minutes into the flight of Apollo 8, this is Mission Control, Houston. Apollo 8, Houston, in the blind. Uh, select Omni, Charlie, over. Houston, Apollo 8 Houston, in the blind. Uh, we've lost all data on you. I request you select us a good on the antenna. Try Charlie, over. Uh, Apollo 8 Houston, in the blind. Your yaw is 42 degrees. I uh, recommend you set pitch and yaw to attitude hold for PPC, over. Uh, Apollo 8, Apollo 8, this is Houston in the blind. Switch to antenna alpha, over. Antenna alpha. Apollo 8, Apollo 8, Houston in the blind, select antenna alpha, antenna alpha, over. Uh, Apollo 8, Houston, over. Apollo 8, Houston, over. Uh, Apollo 8, Houston, over. Apollo 8, Houston, over. Uh, Apollo 8, Houston, over. Apollo 8, Houston, over. Uh, Apollo 8, Apollo 8, this is Houston, Houston, over. Apollo 8, Apollo 8, this is Houston, Houston, over. Apollo 8, Apollo 8, Houston, Houston, over.
Uh, Apollo 8, Houston, over. Uh, Apollo 8, Houston, over. Uh, Apollo 8, Apollo 8, this is Houston. Houston, over. Apollo 8, Apollo 8, this is Houston. Houston, over. Apollo 8, Apollo 8, this is Houston. Houston, over. Apollo 8, Apollo 8, this is Houston. Houston, over. Apollo 8, this is Houston. How do you read? Um, I'll read you like a pair of my comm. Uh, they were busted up on connection. Uh, Roger, Bill. We lost uh, data on you for about 15 minutes and voice comm for about 45. We began to get a little bit itchy. Uh, is your uh, PTC set up for uh, rate command uh, attitude hold? Apollo uh, 8 Houston, uh, set up on me, Charlie, over. Apollo 8, Houston, uh, we're showing you off 54.5, over. Apollo 8, Houston, over. Apollo 8, Houston, say again. Uh, Apollo 8, Apollo 8, Houston, say again. Roger, Bill. I'm trying to be quiet so these other guys can sleep, Jerry. Roger, Bill. This is Apollo Control Houston at uh, 93 hours, uh, 2 minutes, uh, now into the flight of Apollo 8. Apollo 8 uh, now 11,290 nautical miles away from the moon. 
Current velocity, uh, 5,110 feet per second. Uh, we placed several calls in the blind uh, uh, to Apollo 8, and it uh, took a while before we got a response uh, from Bill Anders. And we're going to play that sequence for you now. Apollo Control Houston. Uh, this sequence, uh, somewhat uh, dramatic sounding, uh, was more a matter of curiosity than concern here in Mission Control. Uh, since uh, we were uh, and are getting in good uh, to the spacecraft with commands uh, and receiving uh, solid telemetry. The curiosity, uh, quite frankly, we didn't know for sure if uh, uh, Bill Anders had dozed briefly or if he had gone to the lower equipment bay or just what. Uh, the solution, as uh, Bill himself explained, uh, uh, he had a loose uh, connector. So at uh, 93 hours, uh, 6 minutes into the flight of Apollo, uh, Apollo 8, 8 uh, continue Apollo to 8, monitor. Houston, over. Uh, this is Apollo Control, Houston. Uh, Apollo 8, this is Houston. Uh, Go ahead. Switch to uh, on the Bravo, and we'll try the uh, Bravo Delta switching again, over. bring all of our transcript typists over to pad the audience. Okay, for the uh, purposes of the transcript, I'll introduce these gentlemen again. Uh, on my right is <clears throat> Charles Diedrich, the uh, our return to Earth officer on this shift. Uh, Milton Wendler is the flight director and uh, Jay Green is the Flight Dynamics Officer. And uh, we'll start with a, just a quick run through on the shift from uh, Mel Wendler. Okay, I'll repeat my opening remarks. Whoopee! Uh, Y'all not a very, yes, you can quote me on that. Uh, we're all obviously elated. We realize that we're not home yet but it's, we feel like it's downhill from here, and it actually turns out that the people that you see, uh, Chuck here, the return to Earth officer, and Jay, the flight dynamics officer, are also the ones that will play a uh, big part in the, in the last uh, seven or eight hours prior to the entry. It, it happens that our, our team will be on then. Uh, running through, so we, we know we've got that ahead of us, and uh, we, we have one more shift of... Uh, relatively light activity and then we we get squared away uh, for the entry hoping that the previous teams of course will leave us in fine shape for that but uh, we f do feel like that the the big thing was the TEI burn and we've got that behind us essentially the the burn as you copied were all was uh, was nominal we looked at the engine performance after it was over it was all good and uh, the two gentlemen here can can answer the the questions in details on the uh, on a trajectory, and we hope that you'll be bear with us. If if we look like zombies, why we watch the LOI, of course. We watch the TV, and uh, we tried to get some rest today. And we watched the uh, oh, we were there to, a little bit early, trying to get ourselves pulled together for the uh, last couple of three revs there, and uh, and have just now gotten off uh, shift. So we're we're not in the best of shape ourselves. The crew's in, in pretty good condition, I guess I'd have to say. Uh, uh, I guess I'll have to make the, the medical report tonight by default since we didn't, didn't have the doctor with us. But you're aware that the last couple of revs, we, we pared some of the activity down to let them rest. And I thought that Lovell sounded quite a bit better when he came up to, to get himself squared away for the uh, alignments and the TEI maneuvers. Right now, uh, Borman and, and Lovell are asleep. You're, you're probably aware of all of this. And uh, Anders is awake. We just had a, just as I was, ha had handed over and, were, and was coming back over here, we had a temporary loss of voice comm with the spacecraft. We had data, we lost the data for a short while, but uh, then we lost the voice communication for a while. Apparently some, uh, some plug was disconnected, and that's really about all I know about that, except everybody's on board's okay, of course, and all the systems are still okay. They've been performing fabulously. 
and uh, we we finished uh, finished up with with some small sighting. It's not clear to me yet, and I was talking to the flight planning people, the flight activities people, that that we didn't get some of the data on the backside of the of the moon. The last two or three revs, we we got the 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 tape dump uh, dumps back. Uh, but the quality it was uh, really a mistake in the way they played the voice part of it back and uh, we had to replay that and they were still looking at some of the information so it's it may be that we didn't really miss everything that that we thought on the last couple of revs there but all that'll come out later on we we did the uh, first cislunar navigation on the way out the one we were trying to do pretty early in the game uh, did about two thirds of it really, and as you probably copied on the air to ground, Lovell reported that he was pretty tired and he didn't think he could keep going on it. So we uh, we certainly agreed with him shutting down on that and, and going to the to the rest mode. And I guess we left it uh, about 200,000 away from the Earth and uh, going about 5,300 feet a second and uh, about 76,000 uh, nautical miles, uh, 7,600 nautical miles above the moon. And I hope we don't get into too much of a of a thing tonight on on the reference and all of that. I was kind of interested in in a couple of the in the previous press conference when we had a little discussion on on trains and service stations and things like that. There's just one other thing I'd like to make. You know, several people have have been up here with me, and different people have been present with with the other flight directors, and and I'm sure everybody is aware. And certainly, y'all are aware that this is just the top of the iceberg. Really, uh, there's literally thousands of people working on on the flight. It's gone, I think, to date phenomenally well, and it's a result of, of many man months of, of man years of hard work. And there's there's many many people uh, in the control center. There's lots of people spread all over the world, particularly. Uh, I understand it, that this they might uh, play portion of the press conference out to some of the recovery forces, and I don't know how many thousand men that, that constitutes, but to a serviceman, particularly a Navy man, it's, uh, the Christmas season is pretty precious to him. They, they get away uh, for long tours of duty on, on the water, and uh, they look forward usually to being at home for Christmas, and there's a lot of them that, that don't make it this year. And uh, we certainly appreciate the efforts that they're going to to, to support the uh, recovery part of the operation. And we're we're headed home now, and uh, we're going to expect some fine support in the next couple of days here from them. So with that, uh, unless you have anything else there, Doug, why we'll turn it over for questions. Yeah, we'll open it up to questions. Art? Uh, what does the situation look like as far as uh, mid-course corrections on the way back? <coughs> Uh, well, we took in some preliminary tracking data, and uh, based on that, we need about, uh, it's going to be very small, like six feet per second, and this will be an elapsed time of about 104 hours uh, is about the time of this mid-course, and the flight plans where it's planned nominally, and it is going to be about six foot per second. And is that the only one, then, that you'll need uh well, Probably. that will correct us back to, uh, to trim the entry conditions as best we know the trajectory uh, back to what, exactly what we want. And then with subsequent tracking data and based on how well the maneuver was performed, we may need one, two more uh, mid-courses. Yep. We'll, always, we'll always plan to do one at uh, entry interface minus two hours, and we will do that one in, unless it's less than two-tenths of a foot per second. And I really can't predict how it's going to be, but uh, we have always set up to do that one if we have to. Uh, well, let me ask one more if I may. On the seventh rev uh, level, in addition to commenting on the landing site, also uh, talked about uh, sunrise on the moon and this uh, haze that uh, apparently precedes it. And I wondered if uh, any of you all would care to uh, speculate uh, as to what that might be. Well, I, I certainly wouldn't, uh, I'll, if these gentlemen would like to. Uh, first of all, I, I must not have been in the control center when, when he made that comment, and I know that this morning that uh, there was an expert on it talked about that, and I, don't, I, I really can't contribute any to that. Uh, there'll be millions of people, I guess, studying all that. I was always amused by some of the earlier shots where Everybody said, see, that proves that it's soft, and the other people said, see, that proves it's hard, and all that, the, you know, the surveyors and all that. 
So uh, I, I, I don't know anything about that, really. Does anyone know up there know who wrote that uh, parody of The Night Before Christmas? No, I it's, did you know, Doug? Mm, no, it's, I understood it was somebody in the Mission Planning and Analysis Division. Uh, yeah. could, could you find out? Yes, I'm sure we can. It's, it may be a, a group of people. I, I got the impression that it came from, from kind of a joint effort, but perhaps it was just one. Since all the... Since He's radioactive. The, no, no, that's me. Since all the burns have been so good, so almost perfect, uh, how has this changed your evaluation of, of the whole system? Are you, if there's going to be a next time around the moon, are you going to be just as concerned about as to whether or not it will fire on time and fire correctly? I'm going to be. You will? It hasn't changed your... No, we, we, thought, we thought before we left we had a good, a good system. And we're probably aware that uh, we have burned it many times. The total burn times have, have been in excess of, of what we have. We didn't have any, any single burn this long, but we were confident in the system, but, uh, and, and it's worked out very well. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll feel a little bit better, but I, I can see if, if I happen to be on a shift waiting for TEI, I'm going to feel the same way I expect next time, and the time after that too. But as far as a statistical thing, obviously you've got to feel, the more time you do it, the better you've got to feel. But the, it, well, we always felt technically, you know, unemotionally, we look at it and say, yeah, that's, that's a good system. Emotionally, why well, you've got to say, uh, it's a great feeling when you come around the moon and you get the AOS at the right time and he tells you the residuals are almost nothing. After you acquired the uh, spacecraft signal, the last go around the moon, uh, there was there seemed to be uh, there was a period of a couple of minutes before you got voice contact. Uh, was there any concern? What kind of signal did you re did you receive initially that convinced you that the spacecraft had successfully performed the SPS burn behind the moon? And was there any concern uh, because you didn't immediately get voice contact? I can probably answer that. Our best indication that the burn was performed nominally was the acquisition time. And I would say it was within three seconds of the planned acquisition time that we got the report. I believe it was Honeysuckle at RF acquisition. Was there some communications problem there that you didn't immediately receive voice contact? Let, let me define acquisition. To us in the control center, acquisition comes when the station first says that, that they have a signal from the vehicle. Now, the signal that made us feel so good was not actually of sufficient quality to, to pass the voice information, and the TM was not too good either. Although the TM improved, and in fact, Jay was getting data back, which told him pretty much that it, it looked good before even we, we could get the voice. So. The acquisition that he refers to is 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 is, is not a good quality voice that perhaps you have referred to acquisition. Was there some uh, voice Roger, that uh, you didn't pass on to us uh, that you received initially? No, I'm sure you must have copied. If you want to have one, if you heard the same thing we heard. Uh, Roger. In other words, the first thing was uh, this discussion about there is a Santa Claus. Is that right? Lovell's comment that there is a Santa Claus. Is that the first thing you heard? Uh, all that's kind of... Is that... Yeah, as I recall, the... Um, uh, there was a call put in to the crew from, uh, from the capsule communicator, and, uh, and then we got a response from, <coughs> from Lovell, and uh, one of the first things he said was, uh, was the Santa Claus remark. Well, one other thing, on, on uh, I guess it's today, uh, is there any plan to uh, send some Christmas carols out? There had been some talk about that, and also, uh, which meal is the Christmas meal for the three gentlemen? You mean the, the, what food item? Well, first of all, talk, to talk about your carol, I, I doubt if we'll send any carols up. We, we may decide to do that. We are in a, in a, in a semi-relaxed mode right now, you might say, uh, kind of uh, getting, spend a day here maybe uh, calming down and then another day building back up again for the entry. 
um, we we don't have quite the situation we had in some of the earlier missions where we had two circuits, uh, but we do have the capability of, of sending voice up or, or something up on the uplink and still being in a receive mode on the downlink. We can do that. We, we may choose to do that. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I'm really not going to worry about anything until tomorrow night at 9 o'clock when I go back on duty. Let them worry about all that. And now your other question about the meal. Uh, I, I, I'm sorry, I can't. Do you, mean, do you want to know what they're going to eat? Is that what you mean? The Christmas meal, I guess, is going to be the day's meal. I, you want to know when to eat, perhaps, today, supposedly? Uh, they're going to they the eat whenever they get in, ready to. Isn't one of the meals a built-in Christmas meal with turkey or something like that? Which one is it? The first meal when, the, when uh, Lovell and Andrews wake up? Uh, well, the first time I've got down here for him to I mean, to eat, well, Borman eats when he wakes up, which uh, he's been, uh, uh, a, I mean, awake so long, he may sleep for a whole day. I don't know about that. But around 93 hours, which is two or three hours from now, I guess you could count that as the, if you want to consider that the Christmas meal. That's probably not a very good answer, but I look for them all to sleep for quite a while, and then the first meal that they have, I think, after they've they've rested, I think they'll count that as their Christmas meal, and that's what I would do. Christmas is what you make it, isn't it? I was trying to get uh, clear. The person who <coughs> said, uh, be informed there is a Santa Claus, that was Lovell? It sounded like Lovell to me. Uh, that's. Then who, who said later on, uh, that was a very nice ride, the last one. This engine is the smoothest one. I believe that was Borman. That was the voice that, was, that I understood that it to be. Borman. And uh, the final question. Um, I think the nominal uh, burn to return from the moon is something like 171 seconds, which would get you back in 90-some uh, uh, hours. And it was announced uh, before the mission that they were going to, instead of 170 seconds, they were going to burn for about 200 seconds to get home 24 hours early. And uh, I take it from the burn time that that plan was followed through. You did burn to get home in 69 hours, in other words. Well, not 69, uh, is it? Uh, the return 50 time. Something. See, no, I guess it is six, no, Well, it's the ignition was about 89 hours. It was 89, 19 one five point six seven seconds <laughs> eight nine hours nineteen minutes fifteen point six seven seconds when they lighted and uh splash let me get a good number on splash will be about uh 147 hours three minutes and 34 seconds so that's you got to give me a few minutes on that one but uh that's about uh 50 hours, 57 hours from TEI to entry. So we did elect to come back a day earlier. But so that's your it question. It is the early return. It, it was the thing, that we, it was the plan that we intended to use when we lifted off. Yes. It was a, a return to 146 hours approximately in the Pacific. Yes. As opposed to the early one of 170 hours, 24. Yeah. Which, yeah, it, it, was no, it was the nominal thing that we lifted off with. In fact, the maneuver was almost exactly what was planned. Milt, on uh, Apollo 7, they had a, an anomaly sheet or something like that where they listed any t anything that went wrong, any type of glitch, whether it was solved or not, whether yes. they had to wait for the ship to get back or not, or whether it, I think it even included some pre-launch. You keep that on this mission, and if you do, how many entries do you have on that? Well, uh, you could play the game, you know, what's an anomaly? Yes, there are probably a whole bunch of people keeping logs like that. We have a short one up in the, uh, uh, one up in the control center that uh, the uh, assistant flight director keeps. Uh, the last time I looked at it, it had perhaps seven or eight entries, but some of these were not real anomalies. Uh, like, you know, the Mae West is inflated. As far as we know, it's still inflated, stuffed under a couch somewhere, and we haven't even worried about uh, asking them yet. Is it, is it still inflated? So we've got that, for example, listed. I don't really count that as an anomaly. Although the fact that it inflated by itself is will be one, I'm sure. So that's one. Does that answer your question? Uh, uh, there's, there's essentially no real anomalies. Uh, uh, 
I mean any serious ones. These are all real small, small type things. Well, that pretty well answers it. I think they had something like uh, just the number of entries, which maybe were, you know, not really problems. Mm -hmm. On the other one was in the 30s, I That's believe. That's right. Now, by this time on 7, as you're yeah. aware, there were several that were yeah. pretty, pretty, uh, uh, they were substantial. I mean, not substantial, but, you know, they were, they were things that we really wanted to track down and people working pretty hard on them. Is this a better bird than 7? Is this what? Is this a better bird than 7? Uh, I'd have to say it is. one you've got, you know, is always the best one. You, you don't consider the uh, window fogging problem, uh, which was apparent during the TV transmission, to be a serious problem? Well, uh, no, I guess you couldn't hardly classify it as a, as a serious problem. The main windows that we plan to use, uh, the rendezvous windows, are essentially usable and essentially clear. Uh, I, I think it's kind of unfortunate, though, that, that, it, that it happens, and I sure hope we can find out why. It's hard, bad to have a window you can't use. No, are you saying that nothing of any real significance has gone wrong in this flight? I would say that, yes. Um, uh, how about saying it? Would you mind how about saying, saying it? it? Yeah. Yeah, nothing has gone wrong of any significance. We're happy as clams. It's uh, amazing. The only thing that's gone wrong is when I tried to explain which way the moon, uh, which way the North Pole was the other night. Did, did that all get squared away now? Merry Christmas. Thank you very much. Houston, say again. Omni Bravo. Roger, Omni Bravo. Uh, Apollo 8, Houston. Uh, looks like we're getting pretty far off in both pitch and yaw. Going about... Uh, 50 degrees in pitch and about 25 in yaw. Roger, I'm heading back. Roger, Houston, at, uh, uh, this is Apollo Control Houston at 93 hours, 49 minutes into the flight of Apollo 8. Apollo 8 now uh, 13,635 uh, nautical miles. Uh, out from the moon on its uh, trip home. Current velocity, uh, 5,037.4 feet per second. Uh, we've had uh, brief conversations uh, with Bill Anders aboard the uh, Apollo 8 spacecraft, and we're going to play those for you now. Apollo Control Houston, as you heard, the conversations uh, dealt uh, primarily with uh, communications uh, procedural matters. At uh, the present time, our Apollo 8 spacecraft, by the way, considerably lighter than on the trip out. Current weight reading, uh, 31,739 pounds. Uh, this reflecting uh, the uh, two major service propulsion system engine burns on uh, uh, this day of uh, lunar orbit. I should say yesterday. Uh, day of lunar orbit uh, since this is Christmas Day and uh, we're past midnight. So at uh, 93 hours uh, 52 minutes into the flight of Apollo 8, uh, this is Apollo Control Houston. Uh, Apollo 8, this is Houston. All systems looking good. Over. This is Apollo Control Houston at uh, 94 hours, uh, 29 minutes, uh, now into the flight of Apollo 8. 
Apollo 8, uh, now 19,662 nautical miles away from the moon, and it's uh, heading back towards Earth. Uh, current velocity uh, stands at uh, 4,056 uh, feet per second. Uh, since our last report, uh, we've only had a, a very brief exchange with the crew, uh, I believe some seven seconds in duration, a, uh, a systems check, and we're going to play that uh, for you okay, now. Over. Uh, this is Apollo Control Houston. Uh, the uh, acknowledgement uh, from Bill Anders uh, was that uh, all si was in response to a question or a statement that all systems uh, looked good. Uh, perhaps uh, we should qualify uh, uh, our last remark about uh, two major SPS burns around the moon, uh, since uh, the uh, service propulsion system engine was certainly fired three times. LOI-2 uh, was indeed a major burn as a mission event, uh, but expended uh, considerably less uh, delta V uh, than the lunar orbit insertion uh, burn number one uh, and the uh, TEI burns did. So at uh, 94 hours, uh, 30 minutes, uh, it's quite peaceful is perhaps the best terminology, uh, calm in Mission Control Center on this early Christmas morning. And we will continue to monitor uh, any future conversations. But uh, at this time, uh, we'll sign off. Uh, this is Apollo Control Houston. Apollo 8, Houston. Uh, Apollo 8, Houston, over. Uh, Apollo 8, this is Houston. Uh, your systems are all looking good. Uh, we've got a flight plan update for you. At time uh, 96. You can delete P-52. Your drift rates are real small. Roger, I'd like to do the uh, coordination at about uh, 9530, if I could. Roger, understand coordination 9530, okay? Understand going Delta. We're on, uh, we're on Charlie now. Uh, Roger, understand you're on Charlie. Uh, break. Uh, verify your up PLM switch is uh, command reset is at normal. Over. Houston, we have you on Delta. You can go to Bravo. Break. Uh, give us a call when you finish your coronation. Over. Okay. Uh, everybody seems to be turning around now, so we'll probably just do it on time. Oh, okay. Houston, uh, Roger, uh, permission granted. Uh, Bill, have a good fleet. Thank you. 
Uh, Apollo 8, Houston, looks like you'll need about uh, three more hours on that battery A charging, over. Okay, well, my cohort's going to have it. Roger. Uh, Apollo 8, Houston, uh, can we get a crew status report on Bill before he goes to sleep? Uh, he's feeling fine. A little sleepy. Roger. And, uh, had a meal about, had a meal about, uh, two hours ago. Drinking lots of water. Roger, Bell, thanks. Okay. Good night. Good night. Wish everybody Merry Christmas for me. Sure will, Bell. Same to you. Make sure Bill hangs up his stocking before he goes to bed. I got it right next to my teddy bear. Houston, Apollo 8. Uh, Apollo 8, Houston, go. Roger, Frank, good morning. Good morning. Uh, this is Apollo Control Houston at uh, 95 hours, uh, 7 minutes uh, into the flight of Apollo 8. Although the uh, Apollo 8 spacecraft uh, won't enter the Earth's sphere of influence until uh, it's uh, at an altitude of 175,528 nautical miles above the Earth. Uh, our displays here in Mission Control uh, have now switched uh, to an Earth reference system. At uh, the present time, uh, relative uh, to the Earth, uh, we read an altitude of 189,133 nautical miles. Uh, our velocity reading uh, relative to the Earth currently reads 4,055.9 uh, four uh, feet per second. Uh, as we pick up conversation uh, with the crew, uh, we find that uh, spacecraft commander uh, Frank Borman and uh, command module pilot uh, Jim Lovell are just waking up and uh, Bill Anders is uh, tucking in uh, uh, for the night, or we should say early morning. And we'll pick up that conversation now. Uh, Apollo 8, this is Houston. I have a little uh, feature news and sports news for you, if you'd like to hear it. Uh, Roger, 
Roger, Frank. I have some uh, feature page and sports page news if you'd like it. Roger. Uh, Roger, first of all, Frank, the, the guys down here on the consoles want to express their appreciation for a beautiful television job done. Roger. We'll start out with the sports news. Uh, Los Angeles Dodger pitcher Sandy Koufax and Ann Widmark, 23-year-old daughter of actor Richard Widmark, plan to marry sometime in the near future. Koufax said Tuesday that uh, no date for the wedding was set, but he and Miss Widmark have been dating for some time. At Springfield, Missouri. Oh, again. Morning, Jerry. Morning, Jim. Let's see in Springville, Springfield, Missouri. Uh, Mickey Owen, the old-time catcher for the Brooklyn Dodgers, uh, who uh, made the record books by dropping a third strike that led the New York Yankees uh, to a victory over the uh, Dodgers in the 41 World Series. Uh, decided that uh, he would be remembered by more than just the sports records. Uh, 45 boys and girls uh, have been the recipients of ponies that uh, he offered. Uh, these youngsters were uh, requested to send letters to him telling him how they would care for a pony. When the letters poured in, uh, he added uh, five ponies to the 20 he already offered and uh, other donors pitched in 20 more. And uh, said, Mickey Owen, I thought I had to have about 45 letters, but I ended up with about 900. Now on the feature page, uh, Wellington, New Zealand, about 50 men sat down to the traditional turkey and cranberry sauce at the South Pole today. But the Christmas dinner had an oriental flavor as well. It included kiyaki cooked by members of a Japanese party who are crossing the Antarctic continent and stopped for the day at the U.S. Navy's polar base. In San Diego, California, the crewmen of the captured intelligence ship, ship Pueblo donated their first paycheck to the workers at San Diego's Balboa Naval Hospital. Uh, they had all been, been given $20 each, and when they landed in San Diego, and they felt that this was a good demonstration of their feeling for those who had done so much to make their welcome here. Houston, uh, we read your antenna change. You still reading it? Roger, still read you. Roger. We did not change the antenna, though. You must. Okay. Are you all okay? In uh, Reno, Nevada. Uh, that's affirmative, Frank. We changed the antenna from here. Uh, in Reno, Nevada, because there's no fireplace in his home, a little boy wrote Santa Claus in care of the local newspaper and suggested, would you please use the front door? You'll have to kick the bottom a little bit because it's thick. In Little Rock, Arkansas, babies born at St. Vincent Infirmary during the week before Christmas and through Christmas Day are being released to their mothers at discharge time in huge red Christmas stockings. Here's one in ecumenical cooperation. In Indio, California, the chief of police was armed Christmas Day with a prayer book. Rabbi Philip H. Weinberg took over as chief for a day so that the real police chief, Homer Hunt, a Methodist, could spend a holiday with his family. This is the third straight Christmas the rabbi has filled in for Hunt. 
The previous six years, Rabbi Weinberg did the same for the Roman Catholic Police Chief of Reno, Nevada. From the Associated Press, Americans watch Pope Paul celebrate Christmas Mass in Italy, and Europeans viewed a Christmas greeting from Apollo 8 via the most powerful communication satellite yet sent aloft. The views of Pope Paul and the Apollo 8 crew Tuesday night were the first to be relayed across the Atlantic commercially by Intelsat 3, which was launched from Cape Kennedy last Wednesday. That's the one we saw go. Intelsat, the 63 Nation International Communications Consortium, provides a start on the first global communications network. The new satellite is scheduled to begin full commercial service on January 2nd, initially serving the North and South America and Europe. Further coverage of the Apollo 8 mission is to be relayed to Europe this week. Washington, this Christmas the world is brightened with the hope of peace. When it comes, when hope turns to substance and the guns are quiet once again, it will come because you have pursued it with courage and skill. This was a message from President Johnson to the armed forces on Christmas. Uh, here's a feature by Harry Rosenthal, Associated Press. Uh, this is uh, from Houston. Two Santas brightened the Christmas Eve for two-year-old Jeffrey Lovell. The first one knocked on his front door and brought presents. The second started his daddy home from the moon. The first wore a red suit and a white beard and ho-hoed, loud enough to be heard down the block. The second was a huge engine spinning flame behind the moon and thousands of people are awaiting, were awaiting word that it had fired. Please be informed that there is a Santa Claus with the first word from Apollo 8 as it emerged from radio silence to inform an anxious world 15 minutes after the fact that the engine had performed its critical burn. None of us expect to ever have a better Christmas present than this one, said Ken Mattingly at Mission Control. Well, thank everyone on the ground for us. You know we couldn't have done it without you, came the reply from Colonel Frank Borman, the spacecraft commander. At this point, a Christmas tree came aglow in front of the consoles and mission control, and astronaut Harrison Schmidt read a space version of a visit from St. Nicholas to the crew. It was the night before Christmas, and way out in space, the Apollo 8 crew had just won the moon race. It began. The mission control crew had delayed its celebration until Jeffrey's daddy, Navy Captain James Lovell, along with Air Force Major William A. Anders and Colonel Borman, was safely on their way home. Any other Christmas Eve, the families of the three astronauts would have been in church for Christmas services. But this year, they were all glued to their television sets. The homes all near the manned spacecraft center were decorated. The lawn around the Lovell home and throughout his community of Timber Cove was lined with Mexican-style luminarios. And the four Lovell children came out to light them at about 7.30. They were just in time. At 8 o'clock, a car drove up carrying a tall Santa Claus with a large sack on his back. He ho-hoed up to the door and knocked loudly. It opened, and there stood Jeffrey Lovell, who will be three on January 14th. Jeffrey recoiled at the sight. His mother held him up. Jeffrey clung to her, still shying away. Last year he ran away crying, said his 15-year-old sister Barbara. Earlier she had to run after him to prevent his blowing out all the luminarios. The other Lovell children, 13-year-old James, 10-year-old Susan, watched with great amusement. Finally, the Santa and the children disappeared inside. The presents were put under the tree, not to be opened until today. Mrs. Lovell prepared, prepared eggnog and cookies for the guests, and they watched the 25-minute televised tour of the moon conducted by the three astronauts. 
Later, friends took Mrs. Lovell, Barbara, and Jeffrey on a tour of the neighborhood, brightly lighted for Christmas. Above them, in a clear sky, the quarter moon shone brightly. And the three astronauts, who more than any other men have seen the fruits of creation, paused in their scientific exploration there to beam to the earth the majestic words from Genesis. And God created the firmament heaven, and God, God called the dry land earth, and God saw that it was good. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, Roger, we have a newspaper coming in after a while. We'll give you a little more news later. Thank you, Jerry. That's, uh, that's fine. Uh, Jerry, we've chlorinated the water and we're changing the canister now. Uh, Roger, Frank, copy. Apollo 8, Houston, uh, would you put the biomed switch uh, to left? And uh, we'd like a crew status report on uh, Jim and Frank when you get a chance. Uh, Houston, uh, both uh, Frank and myself had uh, a meal before bed last night. And I, I believe we had about 20 clicks of water. And a good night's rest, uh, just getting up. Roger, Jim. Thank you. Apollo Control Houston, as you heard, uh, Bill Anders, uh, just before retiring, uh, had requested and received permission uh, to uh, take a short acting sleeping pill. Borman and Lovell, now up, uh, listened to their early morning deep space newscast. After uh, Jerry Carr completed his newscast to the crew, uh, flight director Glenn Lunny uh, grinned and said, quote, uh, there's a new item on the wire, Jerry. They want you to take a job in New York as a newscaster. And so at uh, 95 hours, 27 minutes into the flight of Apollo 8, uh, this is Apollo Controlled Houston. Uh, Jerry, this is Frank. Do you have any later word on our trajectory and how the tracking looks? Uh, Roger, stand by, Frank. We'll give you an update. Apollo 8, Houston, we're looking at a mid-course correction at 104 hours of uh, about 5 feet per second. Your tracking is real good. We got you in the center of the corridor and on target. Understand, 5 feet per second at 104 hours. Uh, that's firm. Uh, Frank, did you get the word that we deleted the P-52 at 96? Roger, do you mind if we go ahead and do it now? Uh, negative. Uh, we've deleted it. Uh, your drift rates are so mo small that you don't even need to unless you want to do it. Okay, we won't. Uh, Roger. Apollo 8, Houston. Go ahead, Houston. Uh, Roger, Frank, in three minutes, we're uh, handing control from Honeysuckle over to Madrid. Over. Thank you. For Roger.
Apollo 8, Houston, Buenos Dias from Madrid. Houston, uh, reading you uh, loud and very noisy. Houston, Apollo 8, how do you read? Uh, Apollo 8, Houston, loud and clear, how me? Roger, Frank. Okay, I, I wasn't sure we were lights up, thank you. Apollo 8, Houston, uh, if you don't need the computer, uh, we'd like to have you call up Verb 64, enter, so that we can uh, do the BD antenna switching from the ground, over. Apollo 8, Houston. Jim, if uh, you don't need the uh, computer, would you call up Verb 64 Enter and uh, we'll take care of the antenna BD switching down here, over. Roger. And we just did an automatic maneuver to get over back to BD and see how to do. Uh, Roger. This is Apollo Control Houston at uh, 96 hours into the flight of Apollo 8. Uh, the Apollo 8 spacecraft at this time is uh, 187,043 nautical miles away from Earth. Uh, its uh, velocity relative to Earth uh, now reads uh, 4,063 uh, feet per second. Uh, during the past 20-some-odd uh, minutes, uh, we've had uh, a couple of conversations uh, with the Apollo 8 crew, and uh, we're going to pass those on to you now. This is Apollo Control Houston. Uh, this five uh, feet per second mid-course correction at 104 hours is performed uh, perpendicular to the radius vector, or roughly uh, this would be perpendicular to the flight path. So at uh, 96 hours, uh, four minutes into the flight of Apollo 8, uh, this is Apollo Control Houston.